Thank you very much, Liz. Um, and it's now time for me to introduce the discussant of this session. That is me, Sylvia Tidy. Was I to do that? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think there are rules for that. Um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Amsterdam, and uh, I'm very happy to be here today. And I would like, I would first of all like to thank you, Liz, for inviting me to be a discussant for this very interesting and truly interdisciplinary panel. And I would also like to thank all of the presenters for their wonderful and thought-provoking uh, presentations. Now, although I, and I have to come clean about this immediately, am in no way an authority on drug use, uh, drug policy, or the anti-drug project in Indonesia, uh, my own research on corruption in Indonesian bureaucracy and HIV AIDS and human rights activi activism among Indonesian transgender women have made me familiar with the blurriness between legality and illegality. Uh, an, amb an ambiguity of policy reforms and frictions between state building and health concerns that all resonate in today's panel and presentations. This panel, which consists of a great mix of uh, political sociology, law, public health, and anthropology, is set out to investigate somewhat of a tension in Indonesia's current policy response to drug use and drug users, namely that between an evidence-based approach uh, to, let me see, an evidence-based approach uh, to stem the medical and societal ills associated with drug use that draws on general harm reduction principles and advocates things such as needle and syringe exchange, uh, methadone trials and rehabilitation uh, on the one hand, and a punitive approach that takes inspiration from the global war on drugs, which favors incarceration and, as we have heard, execution on the other. What has surprised many scholars with a professional interest in Indonesia with regards to some of the recent harsh responses to drug use and users is that these contradict the expectations or perhaps hopes they had of the kind of state that Indonesia would be almost two decades after the end of ex-president Suharto's authoritarian new order rule. As I'm sure everybody here knows, in 1998, then-president Suharto stepped down amidst furious cries for reformation, which generally entailed uh, demands for less corruption, more attention to human rights issues, and more democracy. Almost two decades later, in spite of truly admirable legal and administrative changes, corruption is still, or perhaps again, rampant. Human rights are not generally respected, especially when concerning uh, social undesirables such as drug users. And the verdict on the successes of democratization is not unanimously optimistic. It is in this context of a somewhat insecure and unstable state that, had, that has not yet or entirely found its bearings that I want to place the tension inherent in Indonesia's contemporary drug policy. So in this discuss discussion, I uh, first want to sketch some historical backgrounds to understanding uh, this drug policy, um, and in particular its two contradictory strains. Then I will give some comments to each individual uh, presenter, and finally I will end with a broad question for internal or general discussion, or just to be ignored, is also fine. When thinking about drug policy in Indonesia, it is good to keep in mind that um, even though the present preoccupation with punishing or rehabilitating drug users suggests otherwise, not all drugs uh, understood here in a very broad sense uh, as stimulating substances of some sort um, are policed or regulated. Indonesia, as I'm sure you all know, is a huge archipelago that consists of over 14,000 islands. It is the world's fourth largest population and is home to hundreds of distinct ethnic and linguistic groups. For some of those peoples, the use of certain stimulants or mood-altering, etc., substances forms an important part of everyday social and spiritual life and health. What would hospitality be like in Timor if there would be no fetal nut to offer guests? What would the solidification of new or reaffirming of existing bonds between families in Sulawesi be like without the sharing of traditionally brewed palm liquor? And also, how can you conduct a proper business deal, uh, business transaction in Jakarta without sharing a few bottles of expensive imported alcohol to solidify the deal while singing karaoke? It is, at least to my understanding, not these kinds of substances uh, that the drug-related uh, regulations that came into being from the late 70s onwards and gathered strength in the post suharto era sought to curtail. Rather, laws and policies concerned concern substances such as uh, benzodiazepines, uh, poplo, methamphetamines, sabu sabu, uh, weed and marijuana, maybe to a lesser extent, uh, ecstasy, cocaine, and perhaps most importantly, heroin, hutao. It is also good to remember that, and Lex mentioned this already, that the use of some of these drugs are by no means new or have always been subject to regulations and restricted. 
In fact, in the 17th century, during the Dutch or VOC colonial era, the opium trade was a very profitable endeavor for the Dutch, and opium use was actively promoted. In 1817, furthermore, Sir Stamford Raffles, then British Lieutenant Governor of Java, noted the widespread use of opium and marijuana and other substances on Java and other islands. Given Indonesia's geographical proximity to, to both uh, Southeast Asia's so-called uh, Golden Triangle, an important source of opium in the region, and relative proximity to Afghanistan, it is fairly likely that opium and opioids have been around since then. So if drug policy, therefore, is not obviously tied to a sudden availability of drugs or a general condemnation of all substances, then I suggest we had better understand it in the particular national context of Indonesian state building and a wider international response to drug use. Indonesia's first um, uh, narcotics law came into being in 1976, which we should keep in mind is a mere few years after Nixon proclaimed drug use to be the US's public enemy number one and thereby initiated what would turn out to be a devastating war on drugs, enmeshing people and states across the globe in its punitive politics of militarization and incarceration to this very day. As Sudirma Nasir, an Indonesian drug policy expert, describes it, the war on drugs is characterized by a tough and even macho approach to drug use and users. It favors incarceration over rehabilitation, punishment over access to life-saving services, and simplistic solutions over evidence-based approaches. It is no surprise, then, uh, that tough and macho Bapa Suharto favored a war on drugs-inspired approach in his already militarized New Order regime to continue his authoritarian hold over the Indonesian nation-state. It is perhaps also telling that the next drug-related laws on psychotropic drugs and narcotics, as Ajin describes, were installed in 1997, just as Suharto was losing his grip on power. So if one strain of Indonesia's uh, current contentious drug policy is intimately intertwined with uh, the decades-old global war on drugs, and its concern, its concern with the strength, stability, stability, and security of states, then the second strain needs to be understood in light of the health of populations in the wake of the HIV-AIDS pandemic that started in the 1980s and gathered uh, significant speed in Indonesia in the late 1990s and 2000s. As HIV-AIDS ravaged through so-called high-risk populations, such as injecting drug users, it became increasingly clear to those working in public health, epidemiology, and so forth, that the war on drugs punitive approaches did little to stem the epidemic, and in fact only exacerbated it. And Ajing, I think, gave us a very good example of this with your last, one of your last slides. In order to successfully combat HIV-AIDS and uh, Hep C, as uh, Claudia talked about, the focus needed to shift from punishment and misguided ideological tough talk to evidence-based approaches and harm reduction practices. This entails, for example, as we've heard a few times already, needle and syringe exchanges, access to health-related services, and possibilities, possibilities for rehabilitation. It advocates a suspension of moral condemnation, condemnation of drug use and drug users, and a move towards acknowledge, acknowledging the humanity and the rights of those involved in drug use and drugs. So it is clear by now, I hope, that both of these measures and rhetoric uh, in these two contrasting approaches uh, differ markedly. Both these approaches battle for prominence in post-Suharto or post-Reformation Indonesia. The ambiguity inherent in drug policy that this panel addresses mirrors a deeper ambiguity in the current constitution of the Indonesian nation-state. As I said earlier, almost two decades after Suharto's resignation, Indonesia is still torn or undecided or conflicted regard regarding what kind of nation state it is or is becoming. The reformation movement ushered in, push, ushered in a push towards what is known as good governance, with its prized ideals of democratization, anti-corruption, and human rights. Now, this has absolutely opened the way for countless NGOs, activists, journalists, and academics even, as uh, Liz talked about, to critically engage with emerging possibilities for citizenship, care, and politics. However, the tough guy tactics of macho men remain a powerful influence in present day politics. Furthermore, uh, voices proclaiming particular forms of radical Islam gain increasing volume in discussions con concerning Indonesian becoming as well. All of this also comes to the fore in the question of drug policy. On the one hand, there is a proliferation of drug-related NGOs, activism, harm reduction services, and human rights discussions, while on the other, the Indonesian government seems to be taking an increasingly punitive stance towards drug use. Um, and one example of this is the much-protested uh, execution of the Bali Nine. 
Also, there is a rise in extra-legal executions of drug users by gangs, some of whom, but by no means all, operate from religious convictions. It is exactly this current climate of general ambiguity that these presentations uh, on, the, on the ambiguities inherent in uh, contemporary drug policy in Indonesia capture, and each does so, I think, really well from its own particular angle. Now, we changed the order of the presentation, so I have to find the right comments with the right person. Yes, here we go. So to start off, um, the first presenter, Ajay Narasati, took a human rights-inspired uh, legal approach to address the consequences of recent drug-related legislation. She took us through the legal context and legal hierarchies and gaps and loopholes of the drug policy. Uh, and she showed us how um, post to Indonesia increasingly seems to move toward a criminalization of drug, user, drug use and drug users. She also shows us the failures of law number 35 uh, from 2009 on compulsory, compulsory rehabilitation. In fact, so she suggests, contemporary drug policy does not uh, reduce drug use uh, in any significant way. Drug use seems to have gone up. What it does do is obstruct um, users' ability to access drug-related harm reduction programs. Furthermore, she also points out uh, the human rights cost of uh, current policy. So uh, the current approach hinders users' right to health by obstructing access uh, to treatment. It frustrates users' right, for fair, right to fair trial because access to legal aid is not necessarily a given. It contradicts users' right to be free from torture and ill treatment since the punitive approach encourages a, pro a proliferation of practices that constitute torture. And ultimately contradicts users' right to life since, as Liz already showed very well as well, drug offenses carry death sentences. Adding this provides uh, a legal perspective that starts this panel up quite nicely. I want to ask Adding first of all, where you think possibilities for change and improvement are? Very easy question to start with, <laughs> of course. Um, are there, for instance, particular rights that have a better chance of being respected than others? Um, and if so, why? Uh, you mentioned, as, did, uh, as Lex did as well, that rehabilitation for drug use is compulsory. Uh, but you also point out that it's, uh, well, quite magnificent failures. And this made me curious, what does rehabilitation actually uh, look like? From what I've seen and heard, uh, sometimes going to prison might be preferable over going uh, into some rehab center. So what does that look like? Um, finally, Indonesia is notorious for its discrepancy between what is written in the law and what actually happens. To what extent do you think that legal changes, including those promoting policy in line with human rights, will actually make a difference in the lives of drug users and those affected by drug use and drug use policy. Okay. The second presenter, Claudia Stocescu, takes us in a detailed public health-inspired tour of factors that are associated with unsafe injecting practices among women who inject drugs in the greater Jakarta area. In a national context in which a punitive approach to drug use and drug users seems to be on the rise, she shows us that there is still space for evidence-based harm reduction approaches. Through careful investigation and analysis, she shows the role that socio-political legal environments play in predicting unsafe injecting practices and the association between factors in women's micro and macro physical and social environments such as intimate partner violence, victimization, and injecting in public places, and their increased odds of receptive syringe sharing and the sharing of injecting paraphernalia. A great merit of this study is that it focuses on an uh, as of yet understudied and generally <coughs> neglected risk population, namely female injecting drug users. Um, I'm still left with a few questions though. First of all, why are women so understudied? The obvious question. Is it just an Indonesian thing? Probably not. Is it a general thing? How come? Um, also, this study was conducted in the greater Jakarta area. Uh, do you have any idea how relevant th these findings are in other parts of Indonesia? I mean, it could be Java, but also uh, Papua, Timor, etc. Do you have any idea? And uh, you told us a little bit about how you came up with, the, uh, with your tested risk environment factors. So I think you said you got them from roads at the London School of I forgot. Um, does it mean that these particular risk um, environment factors are applicable everywhere? Do you have to modify them in any way to make them particularly useful or good, appropriate for Indonesia? 
And finally, and I'm asking this as a public health and social policy newbie, um, I see from your data that there is an association or a co correlation between risk factors um, such as intimate partner violence victimization and injecting in public places uh, and the sharing of syringes and other paraphernalia. But could you tell us more about how these are related, perhaps through some examples uh, from when we came to know? You did this quite nicely with injecting in a public example. Um, the third presenter, Lex Kuyper, takes an anthropological approach to sketching the borderlands in which drug users in Indonesia now live, stuck as they are between competing discourses that portray them as either a danger to the Indonesian nation or as uh, patients that need to be saved, and it gives the nation the role of savior. Describing a commemoration that took place in Jakarta in honor of the International Day Against Drug Abuse and Illicit Trafficking, uh, Lex does a great job of acquainting us with both positions and some of their roots. Particularly interesting, though, is the potential for slippage that he shows exists between the two. There is no unambiguous taking up of the patient position. The potential for being viewed as dangerous is always present. In showing us this, uh, Lex also points at a wider problem that I uh, pointed at before, namely what kind of nation state Indonesia wants to be or to become, one at risk that needs to secure itself against internal threats or a benevolent protector that cares for disenfranchised citizens. With this in mind, I want to ask you something in relation to the opium war example uh, that you mentioned, that Vice or ex-Vice President Uriono uses to buttress his warnings against the threat drug use poses. Uriono blames China's collapse on England's, England's pushing of opium onto the Chinese. He now compares international networks of drug dealers to England's position in the opium wars. I was wondering, though, whether you think Budiono's caution could also be read as a critique to what might be viewed as a Western interference into matters of Indonesian sovereignty, stability, and national integrity. Not unlike, uh, well, what I will ask of Liz later, so beware. <laughs> I'll repeat it when it's your turn. In other words, could his vigilance also be seen as a defense against the import of things like human rights and harm reduction? Uh, that weaken a particular sense of the Indonesian nation state. I was also wondering to what extent you see historical parallels between the contemporary view of drug users uh, and also, for instance, LGBT people as a threat to the nation and other instances of, this, uh, of the state targeting suspicious insider outsiders in Indonesia. I'm thinking here, for example, of the communist killings in the 1960s and the Patriots killings in the 1980s. And then finally, um, Liz Kramer uh, took a political sociological approach in her presentation on uh, academics' attempts to influence Indonesian drug policy. She describes how in 2015, a very group of academics published an article in The Lancet criticizing the Indonesian government's reliance on faulty data as evidence for its approach uh, to curbing the trafficking and sale of illegal drugs in Indonesia. The aim of these academics was twofold. First, to encourage the government to take an evidence-based harm reduction approach to drug policy, and second, to discourage the government from resorting to the death penalty as a punishment for drug-related offenses. This letter was, I believe, written around, around the time that the execution of the so-called Bali Nine, uh, a group of nine Australians who were sentenced to death after smuggling over eight kilos of heroin into oh, Indonesia, was approaching. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, ultimately, the Lancet article proved unsuccessful. Uh, the executions took place and Indonesian drug policy remains unchanged. This addresses this example of, of academics' attempts to influence policy as part of the larger question of the relationship between academia and activism. What is the place for activism in academia, if there is such a place? Um, this is a highly relevant question for, I think, all academics and an absolutely unavoidable one for those of us who work with precarious or in whichever way unfairly treated people. Um, nevertheless, um, I would say that uh, you present the conundrum of academic activism maybe rather too starkly as moving between activist involvement, involvement and professional attachment, by which you give the impression of an academic stance as an objective, detached, and impartial one. While such a stance might, be char might characterize a hard science approach, they might not be entirely representative of many other branches of academia. And of course, as an anthropologist, I'm thinking about anthropology, where striving for objectivity or impartiality has little to do with the academic endeavor. Uh, endeavor. 
Instead, I would say an academic stance, rather than being one of objectivity, detachment, and impartiality, is one of critical scrutiny. And this might also be an asset in activism. So I would therefore uh, like to invite you to exercise such critical scrutiny uh, to the example of academic activism that you present. So where did it go wrong and what could have been done better? You describe the internal differences between the academics who banded together um, with their compatible yet divergent motivations and the various ways in which they try to exert influence. Um, I would, however, like to know a little bit more about them. Who were these academics? Uh, what was their nationality, for instance? Were there any Indonesians involved? And I ask this in light of the ultimate lack of success of this intervention. Um, and as a little example or parallel, the inability of the Australian government to, to prevent the execution of the Bali mine has been contrasted with the Filipino government's successful prevention of the execution of one of its own citizens, Mary Jane Filoso, who had also been sentenced to death in Indonesia on drug smuggling charges. It has been claimed that the Filipino style of negotiation as respectful to Indonesian law and sovereignty proved more successful than the um, heavy-handed, showy, and domineering style exhibited by the Australian government. To what extent, um, yeah, I'm just trying to be a little bit provocative here, to what extent could this example of academic intervention similarly be seen as a meddling, respectless <coughs> interference from outsiders? If so, what kinds of lessons could we learn from what constitutes successful um, um, academic activism? If not, um, how then can we understand this failed attempt? And I have been talking for far too long now, and I'm sure we're all eager to know uh, more from the panelists uh, at this point and give them the chance to, response to, uh, to respond to more questions. So to end my discussion, I will leave the discussions with one final question. Namely, how they, with their own particular views on the pros, cons, and possibilities of Indonesia's current drug policy, would go about changing this policy. There's, and I'm going to go back to a chairperson. Um, perhaps, and it also depends on all of you, maybe we can uh, ask the audience for some questions first, because there's so many of you, and we can get into this over the years later, if uh, that's okay with the audience as well. We can also come for the beers. <laughs> Plenty of questions, but I don't know if they'll have the time to answer. We have like five minutes left to something. How about you? Um, I don't know. How about you start with the questions, and uh, we might ask for a, well, we uh, we might ask for a few more, and we might have to start answering the questions outside. But just go ahead, and we'll see how far uh, we get. Because I had first a methodological question, particularly for you, because I have done research with um, drug users. Uh, not injecting drug users in actually, and I haven't published anything specific so far because I don't know uh, methodologically how to uh, write without giving people up and without uh, admitting to having done and seen uh, things which I haven't reported to the police, although I'm 100% sure that the police knew very well what I was doing. So that, that's um, a question. Uh, and of course, if you take all the reference away, uh, what sense is there uh, in, in writing about a village somewhere in Indonesia? Uh, so this is a question of method, which I haven't come to term with. Secondarily, is everybody brought up the question of nation building and um, uh, in, all the, in all the presentation. And in my experience, um, prison, imprisonment, building, um, the, the very buildings of prison uh, is one of the main <coughs> nation building policies all through the world. Uh, and we can see it in, in, in the US, for instance, for a start, but everywhere and in, in history as well. So I think that um, we cannot see the drug, the drug um, policy without coupling it with a specific um, carceral <coughs> policy which is being developed in Indonesia, um, particularly now uh, that uh, more or less there is some lifting of the silence about uh, the, the great imprisonment of tortures. So these are the questions and I think that they address on different level all the presentation and I hope that I'll get um, some illumination. Should we collect a few more questions, perhaps? Oh. One and two. <laughs>
Uh, I think my question is particularly to Lex and Ajay. Uh, when we talk about rehabilitation and treatment in Indonesia, what kind of models do they base this, this treatment uh, and rehabilitation methods on? Because I guess that would say a bit about what they think is sort of the ex essence of drug addiction. My question is for Claudia. I'm wondering to what extent you took account of subjective issues within your study, such as true knowledge of the risk of HIV and another disease um, transmission through music fields, and maybe also around ideas like, uh, like ideas around nasib or fatalism in health seeking behavior among Indonesian, some Indonesians, and whether that might have been a factor as well. So your, your um, issues were all kind of external to the person. I'm wondering about these possible internal issues. Jerry was first. Uh, can you guys handle two more questions and then maybe answer some of the Yeah. Um, to, to some extent, this, this looks like uh, Indonesia is in a sort of lag with um, other countries, and I wonder how much you're thinking comparatively. Um, lots of echoes of the war on drugs that you've already mentioned. What, what are the uh, chances of Indonesia being like uh, some of the other late arrivals, let's say, and uh, doing a sort of leap to the front? Uh, um, as in, I think, Uruguay, where they're uh, really progressive and um, ref uh, refusing to follow the American footsteps. One, one thing that made me think of this is that um, even at the height of the new order, the, the jail was renamed the Limbo de Pumasarakata. Um, this sort of sounds almost liberal. And is, it, is there some way of maybe combining jailing with therapeutic um, programs? That's another way to maybe tackle it rather than consider them as these sort of uh, policy um, enemies. Uh, just a quick one, um, mainly for Elizabeth. Um, the influence of academics um, towards their government, and uh, what about the influence of academics into the domain of Indonesian studies for the Australian government? Wouldn't be a better focus for yourself? Uh, Indonesian academics. Indonesianist. Oh, so Indonesia is in Australia. In Australia to okay. improve the relation between Indonesia and Australia. Okay. <laughs> I have an Australian passport as well. So shall we uh, try to answer these questions? <laughs> so who wants to go first? <laughs> Uh, okay, let's start with the first question on methodology. Um, yeah, how to keep the anonymity or the safety of your users, and um, that's also what, something that I'm still struggling with. I'm still writing my dissertation, <laughs> so I don't have no, no, necessarily an answer. I, I try to position it in West Java, which already makes it a little bit fuzzy, but there are not only so many methodologies, for instance. So it's, I mean, if, they, if you search, it, you're still able to kind of find these people, and I mean there are a lot of criminal things that I put in there. So I'm also really still thinking about um, how to go about it, because I don't want to say indeed, like these people in Indonesia, right? that yeah, the range is so, so big, it's, yeah, so uh, maybe we can discuss this also in the <laughs> after, <laughs> and then, like just kind of brainstorm together, or maybe some of you have ideas. That, uh, maybe we need a lawyer at some stage. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for you, Claudia, is it not an issue because the, the assumption is that drug users exist in Japan? So it's like, whereas in Aceh, maybe it's more. Well, I both that research with drug uh, smugglers and dealers. In so, Aceh. yeah, and That's producers, perfect. importers. <laughs> not the big ones, I was scared, too scared. Mm -hmm. I was scared already, but it's, it's different. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tackle some of the questions that they have? Sure, there's oh, yeah. there are quite a few. Um, <coughs> I think with I think anonymity is an important issue. Um, confidentiality, I would say, is in that sense a really important issue. 
and um, with, with our with our research, we, everything was anonymous. I think it, it is a little bit different when you're talking about production because you can situate an area geographically, which is a little bit different. You can, I think there are many ways to mask um, identity in open quantitative research. I think it's a little, it could be a bit different on, on qualitative research, actually, because you're also sharing other types of insight. Um, and um, I have an anecdote about this, which I don't think we have time to cover, but we did have um, in our, in, you know, as part of our study, um, some participants who, you know, were interviewing in one particular area one day, and the next day we came and they said, we don't want to speak to you anymore because Ben and came and the National Credit Board came and raided us yesterday. So it was probably because you gave them our data, and it had, you know, potentially had a, a huge impact. Because we really had to do a lot of damage control with the community because they trusted us. Our entire team, my team of women up there, were amazing. Um, 11 women who are all drug users. They were part of that community. Now, these were their friends and peers who suddenly didn't trust them anymore. This was a big issue for them. Um, what we ended up, what we found out happened was that um, there, was a, there was another NGO that was doing outreach in the area, and, and the National Narcotics Board was going around requesting the pro private information that NGOs held of drug users, and they have been systematically using this information to raid, to go to people's houses and intervene and actually tell them to come to treatment or ask them for bribes. So we know this is happening in Jakarta and of course our study then got blamed and eventually we had to deal with that. But just to say that this is, yeah, it's just had, there are so many dimensions. Um, what else was there? So there was um, re rehabilitation models I don't think was, was for me, but that's a really important issue and I just want to mention that um, if, if, I, if you don't mind me saying something about that, Indonesia has um, a community-based rehabilitation model that hasn't been researched very well. Mm -hmm. uh, we've um, recently, in Reduction International, my, my other hat, my non-academic hat, we've just released a report um, uh, documenting a couple of examples in Indonesia and other Southeast Asian countries of voluntary community-based models that use a harm reduction approach to drug treatment. These are very different than the approach that BNM uses. And also very different than the many different approaches that exist in Indonesia. Um, I've recently had um, you know, heard a, a story from an addiction counselor, a friend of mine in Indonesia, who went to a training by the Ministry of Social Affairs. And in their PowerPoint presentation, they included putting drug users in boiling water as a, an effective method for drug treatment. So this was a training that happened a few months ago. And it was provided by professional addiction treatment officials. So just to say that these issues are really problematic, and um, but, but what isn't being researched and what 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 the government does, and what I think could potentially be a um, a good political path to kind of advocate to the government to better treatment, is to look at the existing models of community-based treatment that do exist. They're half they're, they're uh, half the funding for these comes from the global fund. Um, half of it comes from the government itself, um, and they, they are being implemented in about 21 different cities across Indonesia, most of the NGOs. So there are, there are, um, yeah, you can say more about that. Um, I think, I don't think I answered all the questions, I'm really sorry, but I want to give other people some time to speak, so I'll, I'll, um, can you say something out there, maybe? Well, for the rehabilitation, I think Claudia knows better because um, my background is really little, like a legal kind of. I mean, like I know a bit like what what Claudia said about the community-based treatment that are underexposed, despite their um, useful, their um, effective um, approach in dealing with drug use. Um, I noticed one biggest difference from the community-based treatment and the BNN-run uh, treatment is actually how the staff uh, treated the drug user itself. In the community-based treatment, they uh, really uh, provide a supportive environment for this drug user to be to be um, uh, to overcome their dependency, and they do that in a in a less judgmental ways. And uh, when it comes to like BNN, uh, the National Narcotic Board's uh, treatment and uh, rehabilitation centers, uh, the approach is um, 
and still the the nuance is still uh, punitive. You know, like uh, they 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 were treated as a as a number. You know, I, I achieved this target of a hundred people uh, entering rehab our rehabilitation, and they don't really provide the supportive environment <coughs> for these drug users to overcome their dependency. I think that's one of the biggest uh, difference that I noticed from these two rehabilitation centers. Yeah, I think what is important to realize is that there is a, really a lot of different types of rehabilitation. There are also religious, like the, the sun, mm -hmm. where they don't put them in boiling water, but in ice water. <laughs> like, yeah, and there are, there are, yeah, and there are also a lot of private that are really kind of just money machines, basically, mm -hmm. that, that almost don't do anything. Yeah. At least that's from. I've never been to a rehabilitation center, but oh, well, to one. But mostly, I worked uh, with people who told about their time, and there were some really nice experience or good experience, but also a lot of very negative experience. So perhaps we should wrap it up. I'm sure everybody's ready for a drink or a snack at this point. So uh, I suggest we continue the discussion uh, over those drinks and snacks. Thank you all for coming.